welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, Stalker's Breakfast. It's a delicious quick dish from the dishiest chef in Dishville, Mark Gilchrist. I was on Ready Steady Cook as an extra. Gearing up for grouse, we've got the cars, the house, the birds and the top shelf guns from Browning. First time on a grouse day in Cumbria with a bunch of grouse virgins. We have six guns who have never shot a grouse. Thanks to the Northern School of Game and Wildlife at Newton Rigg College in Cumbria, they are all going to get their chance today. They are three top gamekeeping students from the class of 2013 at Newton Rigg. College Principal Wes Johnson, Basque Gamekeeping Officer Hugh Lloyd and Shooting Times Editor Alistair Balmain. This is a walked up day. Gamekeeper Tony tells the guns what to expect, including where and where not to shoot. Gun up as a grouse goes through the line, he says. Where and where not to walk. Avoid the bright green bits of the moor if you want to avoid a soaking, he says. And how to tell when your dog has been bitten by an adder. Now I haven't seen many this year, but this is more for you, Adam. If your dog yelps and suddenly shoots off and you think, well, that was a bit odd, just be mindful of that because if they step on an adder and they get an adder bite, that's the usual reaction. Right, it's up the hill and into the birds. We're only expecting a few today and Tony's strategy is to line the guns out, march them up to the top of the hill and march them down again. It works and first shot goes to Hugh Lloyd. Finding dead grouse in thick heather is not easy, even when the bird lands in front of you. Newton Riggs staff members are in the line as beaters and help him pick the bird. I, I had my first grouse ever, in fact, yeah, so it was very good to shoot that. Yep. Is it you're another grouse version? I am indeed. Well, I was indeed, yeah. It came over from the right. It must have been doing at least 100 mile an hour, I'd have said. Uh, and I just swung through and, and, and shot it in front. It was very pleasing. A pair gets up in front of the camera, which is blocking the shot for Alistair Balmain. There's a cameraman in the way. That's how I'm going to blame. No luck this time, but later on he shoots his first birds. Extremely happy with the left and right of my first shot at grouse. I can't say, I can't, can't say further than that. It's a hard day in the office, it really is. <laughs> there are worse things to be doing on a Monday morning. I really think that. Oh no, what a fabulous morning. With the wind in the right direction, most of the birds are flying straight down the line of guns. The gun at the end, former student Sam, is getting plenty of shooting, but as we reach the top of the hill, no grouse. To make matters worse, Sam has brought his Labrador Paddy, which is showing a bit of Paddy power by disobeying his owner. The day is gorgeous, the Royal Air Force are out enjoying it and the views are spectacular. Whatever the RSPB says about grouse shooters massacring wildlife is clearly nonsense. Thanks to the keepering we spot a ring oozel and a short-eared owl which Tony says is one of a pair that's nesting here. And from the 1800 foot high point above the village of Shap you can see most of the north of England and into Scotland. Coming down the hill and both the former students Adam and James get a go at their first grouse. Sometimes you miss but it's great when you manage to get one. It's my first ever grouse, yeah. Bloody good shot. <laughs> well I just missed two before but yeah, I'm chuffed. <laughs> Very happy thank you. <laughs> what but happened? First grouse. There were two got up, I had uh, two shots at those, missed and then all of a sudden two more got up so I loaded up quickly and then I had two shots again and I finally got one. <laughs> so, thanks a lot. Good. Do you remember your first grouse, Tony? I can't. I haven't shot that many grouse. I uh, can remember my first grouse, I was studying a gill. It was on East Arkengarth Taylor Estate and I would be 17 possibly. 16, no I would be 17. How old are you Adam? I'm 18. There we are, he beats you by yeah. <laughs> Back at the hut for lunch and everyone agrees this is the best way to spend an August day. Now, have you all shot a grouse today? Yes. Uh, I have, yes. No. But you nearly did. <laughs> I nearly did, yeah. I've had plenty of shots. <laughs> um, so you two must be feeling reasonably happy yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a great now, feeling. You don't want to go on into grouse, do you? you want to do deer? Uh, I want to do deer stalking, yeah. That's my passion in life, if you will. But I still really enjoy you know, the management of birds and things like that, I found it interesting. But D is my calling. There is a serious side to the day. Newton Rigg has a seven year lease on this moor, which makes it unique among gamekeeping colleges. 
the ethos of Newton Rig is very much about creating students that are ready for work when they leave. You know, in terms of our business, the measure of our business won't be necessarily what Ofsted say, it'll be what the industry says in two years' time when some of our students, as you've seen today, enter that industry and they're either fit for purpose or they're not. You know, it's more than just giving them a piece of paper. We need to really test them in terms of their skills, their practical skills, their dedication, their ability to come out on a, a wet and cold February morning onto the moor uh, to really get a, get a, a good feel for what for what for the commitment that will be required to be successful in their industry. So hopefully they emerge from our college, from our course, as a real asset to, to the gamekeeping and countryside management industry. You, you've got a moor to play with, which must be absolutely fantastic as a, as a teaching agent. What, what, how's, it, how's it changing your the way you're doing things? It's, it's actually adding to the stable of resources that we've got and um, providing that last little niche that, that we needed. Uh, we have our own partridge shoot, we have our deer management study site and now we've got an upland grouse moor to be able to do all the work on. Everyone out today loses their grouse virginity and maybe it was the long climb up the hill but they are all walking a bit differently. For more about Newton Rigg's gamekeeping courses go to newtonrigg.ac.uk If you'd like to see our definitive film on grouse shooting with top grouse shooter Simon Ward and top gun maker William Powell click on the link that's appeared over the screen that's magically up in the sky behind me. Next, it's somebody else with Butt NV David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. Another British shooter has won a world championship. Field Sports Channel regular Abby Burton took top honours at the Universal Trench competition in Slovenia, two points ahead of Italy's Sabrina Panzeri. Abby is the subject of this week's Schools Challenge TV. Click on the link on the screen for more. Badgers are back in the news. As the badger cull gets underway in the southwest of England and masked animal rights activists threaten violence to farmers and their families, the police have moved in. A man believed to be an anti-badger cull protester was arrested at a government site in Gloucestershire on suspicion of aggravated trespass. Rural terrorist group Three Counties Hunt Saboteurs claim the man was trying to highlight an evil place. Is this the perfect gentleman's companion? Well, ask the owner, Richard Hardy. Pip the Terrier is in Scotland, learning to point and flush grouse. The Hunting Act trial against three members of Yorkshire's Holderness Hunt has collapsed. District Judge Daniel Curtis ruled that the defendants had no case to answer and that the act was difficult to interpret and apply. Why not combine the best of a 4x4 with a boat for fishing and wildfowling? This new water car is a modified Jeep with a Honda engine. Thanks to viewer David Campbell for drawing our attention to it. Now, Sika may be a Japanese deer, but apparently we have a lot to teach the Japanese about managing them. Delegates from Rakunu Gakuen University in Ibetsu, Hokkaido, Japan have visited Basque Sparkshot College, Vickers Game and the Deer Initiative to learn about training and standards in deer management. Hokkaido Island in Japan has a large population of Sika deer and local shooters are keen to encourage more people to take up deer stalking. And finally, a fisherman in Florida on board a vessel aptly named Marlin Darlin was nearly impaled when he reeled in a 350 pound marlin. The entire incident was caught on camera and has since gone viral on YouTube. You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, grouse is something we're well known for in Blighty. We're also famous for big piles in the country and fast sports cars. So, to celebrate the very top end of shooting, the guys from Browning have got together to indulge in a little Bond. James Bond. We might be a nation of bargain hunters, but we don't shirk when it comes to game shooting. One of the most expensive, extravagant, exciting shooting experiences is Glorious Grouse on the glorious 12th of August. And to mark it, the boys from Browning are stepping out in style. Good day shooting, guys. They are going to show off their guns, they are going to be gunning the engines of some superb modern shooting brakes and you are going to walk away from this film with expert tips for shooting driven grouse. So you just bring the gun through it, bump. 
In preparation for some shooting later in the season, they're taking three versions of their top-end B25s out for a day of simulated grouse. First, they're stopping off at an appropriate pile in the country for some refreshments and to let the car's 12-cylinder engines cool. 12! I see a theme developing here. What better way to celebrate the start of the grouse season, or the game season in the UK, the glorious 12th, by incorporating some beautiful guns in the B25, the fantastic game guns, some beautiful cars in the Aston Martins and the Bentleys, all 12 cylinder of course, bringing that combination of the glorious 12 and the glorious 12 cylinders together, and a beautiful location here at Brockett Hall today, and uh, at the start of the season on the 12th of August, it all comes together very nicely. The cars are on loan from HR Owen in Cheltenham. At this point we'd be asking sporting shooter editor Dom Holtham to help us out with the facts and figures of these British beasts. But he's not coming until later. Instead, we have Bentley brand manager Paul Carvel on hand. This is the Bentley GT Speed W12 engine, 616 brake horsepower, fastest road going saloon that Bentley have produced to date at 205 miles per hour. Next, we've got the Aston Martin V12 Vantage Roadster. Underneath that bonnet, they've squeezed the V12 6 litre, 510 brake horsepower engine into the car, top speed of 190 miles per hour, 0 to 60 in 4.1 seconds. GTC speed, again will catapult you 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds, but with all of the comfort and luxury from a Bentley. The Aston Martin Vanquish, flagship of our range, 565 brake horsepower, V12 engine, all carbon body, pretty stunning car, with every throb of the engine, get a mental orgasm. If the cars don't do it for you, the guns will, but more about them in a minute. Our backdrop of Brockett Hall has an infamous connection with exotic motors. It hit the press in the 1990s when Lord Brockett was jailed for burying supercars in the grounds of the house and claiming on the insurance. But those were Italian cars, so his actions are entirely understandable. Today it's an exclusive golf club and venue. It was originally built in, in 1760, um, obviously owned by the Brockett family, which is quite a well-known story, I'm sure. Um, our company took it over in, uh, in the early 90s and, and built it up to what it is now with the two championship golf courses, uh, the Auberge de Lac award-winning restaurant over there as well, and then obviously the hall over here as, a, as an exclusive use venue. Right, that's enough pre-grouse more posing. We need to make sure these guns are able to strut their stuff when it matters. So we're off to Atkin, Grant and Lang's shooting school just a few miles away. They've been busy here developing a special stand for anyone wanting to experience the next best thing to a driven day. They also offer sartorial advice, Dom. So this isn't your typical stand at your average playground. So can you talk us through a bit of the setup you've got here? Yeah, so what we've got here, we've actually got stone from Yorkshire. So we've had this uh, shipped down for us. We've got heather here, which we'll find on a, on a grouse moor. As you can see, it's sunk into the ground. So as we look out, we can't see any traps running in front of us. It's very similar to when you're grouse shooting, you've got very low horizon. We've got six traps out here, so they'll just appear, and we've also got traps that we can move around so you can just shoot them over each shoulder. So this really is as close as you're going to get to the real thing. Absolutely. The practice environment. Yeah, absolutely. And we've really set the, spent a lot of time on setting the targets, so they're actually coming down into, downhill into the butt instead of where a lot, of, a lot of clay targets will go up over you like a partridge target. I've done a bit of shotgun shooting, Charlie, but uh, clearly I'm a peasant. Uh, driven grouse is not something that is normally open to a cove like myself. So could you give us a few tips on what I should be doing? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're actually shooting grouse, they're coming a lot, far, a lot faster and a lot flatter than pheasants and partridges. So instead of a pheasant being nice, high and towering, where you're going to give it a lot of lead in front, these grouse are coming very flat and you've got to get out there at them. So a target when it's coming in towards you, a lot of the time you'll actually still see the bird over the top of the gun because the gun is actually pointing up into the direction where it's going. Okay, so it's, it's not a great deal of lead. Okay. It's quite you got, but you have to be quite positive with your. Yeah, your absolutely. Move. So it's really important to get the line of the bird. So if the bird's quartering in towards you, so if he's coming straight in towards you and just fares off to the side, just go onto the wing tip in the direction it's going. Let's hear a little more about the guns on show today. 
Each of our three Browning guides has a different model, but all of them have been handcrafted by the gun makers and engravers of the Browning Custom Shop in Liège in Belgium. We start at the top with a pair of B25D5Gs in 20 gauge on loan from Reeves at the Royal Berkshire Shooting School. I mean, this is a top of the market gun. Uh, obviously, it's £66,000 for a pair, it's not something you buy lightly. Uh, thankfully, there is a lot of money still around and people do like to buy the best. And um, we're in the market to supplying probably the finest game gun in the world, uh, certainly for balance and feel. And uh, we do have a number of people requesting guns like this on a weekly basis and that's why we have a 24 month lead time. Next is the 28 gauge B25 on loan from Ian Coley shooting ground and it suits Andy down to the ground. It is one of the few guns in life that is both aesthetically pleasing to the eye but is also more reliable than most and is hard working. If you go to any gun shop in the country you'll find B25s that have been around from the 50s and 60s, um, plenty from the 70s and they're still working and going strong today. There's very few guns or models that you'll find that have been going that long and that well. Lastly it's the biggest Browning with the biggest Browning team member Alistair. Starts from around about £22,000 um, this one does actually come with uh, a few extras, um, such as the rounded pistol grip here. And this one is my personal favourite because it's the, the 12 bore calibre. And obviously being the, uh, the biggest chap out of the three, um, brings down the biggest birds. But it's a beautiful weapon, great investment, great value for money. And it's around half the price of a D-grade side-plated gun. So uh, for value for money, it's superb. They say money doesn't bring you happiness, but it certainly gives you choice. It could mean deciding between an Aston or a Bentley, or if they don't raise the hairs on the back of your neck, a pair of B25s just might, especially when the birds are coming at you like little rockets. If you want any more information about the custom shop and these B25s, email info at isbrands.com or watch our Browning Factory film. One day, Rodders. OK, let's see what the world's been up to. It's Hello Charlie. Here's what the world's up to this week. Hello Charlie, this is Stuart and Bieber. We're out uh, on a glorious evening in East, East Sussex, stalking fellow. Hello Charlie, we had a great hunt this morning. 17 birds down here in Cedarville. Can't complain too much, the weather's been perfect. Hello Charlie, just on the plane for an unwanted break from shooting and fishing. Fortunately, due to my new app, I'm able to watch Field Sports channel on the plane. Keep it up. Hello Charlie, this is Mike Robinson from my internet and YouTube TV series. This week, I have been grouse shooting, I've been pike fishing, I've been roebuck and fallow deer stalking, and cooking of course all of those wonderful ingredients. You'll be able to see all these films on my channel very soon. Hello Charlie, we're hanging out here, shooting some geese, having a grand old time. Send us your own Hello Charlie, film yourself on your mobile phone, just a sentence saying Hello Charlie, who you are and what you're up to. Then share it or email it via YouTube, Facebook, Dropbox or you send it, you name it, to charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Next, the incredibly named Max Hunt is leaving Denmark for Kazakhstan on a five-month hunting holiday. He's sending us films from along the way, and this is the first. So finally the big day has come. I've been dreaming about this tour for years. Tomorrow morning my camera guys, two guys will come, they will join me for the whole trip. The plan is to go 7,700 kilometers by that car. Remember, you can watch me on Fieldspot channel every Wednesday night or join me on Facebook at maxhunt.eu. Right, what's next? Yes, Mark is making an offal dish. That can't be right. Oh, sorry, a dish from offal. Deer stalking is good for body, mind and soul. Today we want to feed all three with a simple dish that's ideal for setting you up for the day. The Stalker's Breakfast. We find Mark using a handy roller to prepare our main ingredients. Awful. Not everyone's bag and amusingly not Mark's either. You've just been out stalking, you've just got yourself a deer. Take out the liver and the kidneys and we're going to make a breakfast but it's not breakfast time, it's afternoon time, but it's still the same method. 
get your kidneys, cut them in half. They've got to tend to have a bit of a sort of sinew on them. All right, you need to get this bit off. Oops, without splitting the kidney. See around the edge? Have you got that, David? I can't actually see what I'm doing because you've got the camera in the way, mate. Oh, they didn't do this when I worked for BBC. I was on Ready Steady Cook as an extra. Extra what? Extra sort of, David, do all the sarcasm at the end of it. Kidneys. Personally, sadly, I don't like kidneys or awful because I was force fed it at school. It used to make me cry. David, don't put that bit in. I didn't like it. Every week they made me eat liver. And I, oh. So I'm afraid I won't be eating this. We leave Mark tending to the liver to visit farmer Andy Crow working hard on the combine. Later, we want to feed that hard-working crow man who doesn't know whether it's breakfast, lunch or tea. But we need our raw ingredients. So what's the plan, Mark? What are we doing? My dear's talking. <laughs> this is your idea. What are you asking? Oh, sorry. <laughs> right, serious, serious face. Serious face. Right. We're going to go and try and knock over some bucks on Andy Crows. He's got about 30 or 40 quite big bucks um, living in his rape. I feel, I feel very continental and smart. Um, maybe, maybe if I wear this sort of clothing I'll start behaving and, you know, maybe I'll be forced to wear smart clothes all the time so that I'm on my best behaviour for filming with the Field Sports Channel. Uh, I'm going to wear my Sens as well. Now, I think it was Dom that told me that um, 10 308 bullets that are moderated do as much damage to your ears as 5,000 shotgun rounds. Um, I can believe that, so I always actually wear ear defenders. The other thing is if I put them in and turn the microphones off, I won't have to listen to Thunderfoot David Wright trampling through the undergrowth. I mean, for a light man, you've never heard such a small person make so much noise as he goes through the undergrowth. Mark is certainly looking a lot smarter in his Shooter King forest jacket, except for the shoes, which we have to say are not part of the Shooter King range. We have our suspicions that Mark's had this pair of sensible lace-ups since year 12. Back to the cooking and Mark is popping some sausages and bacon into the oven. The rest will be done in the pan with olive oil and seasoning. Doing, just going to cook uh, some mushrooms and some onions, cook them down, um, salt, pepper, and then I'm going to fry the liver you know, in the pan with all that lot. Then when it's just cooked, take it out, turn the oven off so it's going to relax, leave it in the oven for the two or three minutes it takes me to cook the eggs, put it all together. The elephant in the room, or the chest cavity, is the heart, Crowman's favourite. So what will Mark do with that? Maybe stuff it or something like that uh, with, you know, rice, peppers, onions, that sort of stuff. Um, put it in the oven, wrap it in foil, cook it for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, I would think frying it will make it go pretty tough. In fact, Crow said if you fry it, it's going to go pretty tough. So we've left the heart to one side. Um, and Crow's, if you look in Crow's freezer, it's just full up with hearts and he sells the rest of the animal. So I get the feeling that we're taking the most precious thing away from him. A little bit like when you take man makeup from Roy Upton. You don't have to edit that bit out. <laughs> Mark fries the kidneys and liver for about five minutes, then takes them off the heat to rest, freeing up the pan for the eggs. Right, top tip. If you want to make sure the top of the egg is cooked, plate on top. Back to our stalk and we're into some deer. The trouble is they're on the wrong side of the tracks. What makes matters worse is that there's a perfect young buck amongst the herd. With a tinge of frustration, we move on to the high seat fit for a shooter king. From up here, we can see the fallow have been making a lot of mess. Unfortunately, it's a no-show for us, so in true Blue Peter fashion, we use one we shot earlier, or rather, the liver and kidneys from a row Dom shot earlier. So you got liver, kidney, tomato, home-grown eggs, sorry it's burst, venison sausages, bacon. So what does Crow Jr. think of the stalker's breakfast? Success, Gilchrist. What's the liver like, babe, Crow? It's nice. Though I don't like liver, it actually tastes nice. Doesn't anyone like liver? I love it. 
you'll be glad to hear that some of the meal did find its way across to a grateful Andy, although the portion wasn't as large as we'd hoped. If you would like more information about the Shooter King clothing range, go to shooterking.co.uk. And if you'd like the recipe for Stalker's Breakfast, Mark says, well, watch the film again. He can't remember. Mark setting a new trend there with his stalking shoes. Now let's look at the wider world of hunting, shooting and fishing on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting, shooting and fishing videos that YouTube has to offer. It's definitely new channel week. YouTubers have come back from their August holidays with big plans to get going with their own films. We start with a new hunting channel from a field sports channel viewer. Rich Hunting from the Netherlands is hunting crows, jackdaws and pigeons in the Netherlands. Good work, Rich. Incidentally, Rich Hunting told us not only about his own channel, he gave us this classic, a big game hunter getting beaten up by a leopard. Another new channel comes from Josh James NZ Hunter. Hunting and Fishing New Zealand YouTube intro is the brag video for his channel. I think he's great and will go a long way. Moving into fishing, it's quite hard to tell what's going on here, but it looks fascinating. Halibut Strike, filmed underwater with GoPro camera, was filmed at a depth of 150 feet off the Oregon coast, and it looks like Fishing PDX is actually fishing with a rod underwater. He gets into a 40 pound halibut. Now a kind of fishing. FX Verminator Extreme Air Gun Gar Fishing AOA Showcase sees air guns of Arizona take to the river of East Texas with a FX Verminator Extreme in pursuit of Alligator Guard, using the arrow firing system available with that air gun. Louis from Essex Bushcraft highlights Dave Canterbury's films, which serve to show how Bushcraft goes down a similar but slightly different path to the core hunters and shooters. It's another arrow firing film. In Using the Slingshot to Hunt Big Game, Dave shows how to shoot an arrow from a catapult. Another Bushcrafter, but more in line with hunting, shooting, fishing, and indeed life as we know it, Jim. Turkey Fishing is a surprisingly beautiful go pro-style film of an American guy who has a fishing rod in one hand and a shotgun in the other. Finally, viewer Johnny Pinto points me to a new channel, Wild TV, which is the YouTube version of the Canadian hunting cable outfit of the same name. Well, it's an annoying channel. Everything is exactly 90 seconds long, there are no descriptions, and therefore Wild TV's output looks worryingly unpopular, picking up no more than half a dozen views per film. How could a channel with such great videos get it so wrong? You can click on any of these films to watch them. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv Well if you enjoyed those you'll like Schools Challenge TV well, isn't she just the girl of the moment? Last week winning the Universal Trench World Championship in Slovenia with 187. Click on the link on the screen to watch it. Well, we are back next week, and if you haven't seen them already, here are the binoculars we featured at last week's destruction test. They're still for sale on eBay for the last few days. Go to the link on the screen. And please subscribe to us if you're watching this on YouTube or click to follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook or go to our webpage fieldsportschannel.tv where you can scroll down and on the right you'll find the constant contact form. Pop your email address into that and we'll constantly contact you about our programme that's at 7pm every Wednesday UK time. This has been Field Sports Britain.